It was an early Sunday morning in Virginia. I pulled my vehicle into the open parking lot in front of my apartment. Cold, brisk April air greeted me as I opened my car door. My neighborhood was located next to a main road covered by thick, deciduous trees. They had a way of making it seem like the apartment complex existed apart from the world. The morning was slow and sleepy. Up to the second floor apartment, step after step, Step after step, I reflected on the previous night I spent away from home. It's nice to finally get out of the house, I thought to myself. I grinned as my footsteps echoed upstairs, my feet dancing up each step. My key pressed into the lock. I turned my wrist to open my door. The foyer was small and offered a view into half of my living room. It was illuminated by sunlight from the patio door opposite me. I stepped inside. My attention was caught by the chair of a backless brown stool, by the chair leg of a backless brown stool, placed in the middle of the carpeted living room. Miguel was slumped over the stool in a fashion that confused me as he had not moved or responded when I came in. It took me less than a second to realize that his neck was bound tightly by our dog's leash connected to the ceiling fan above him. A noose. Living with your ex-boyfriend is risky but cost-effective after a breakup. Miguel and I spent the first years of our adult lives together. We both joined the Navy right after high school. A week after we met post boot camp, Miguel swore to me that I would be his wife even though I had to move 800 miles across the country the next day to fulfill military orders. Six months later, he got, six months later, he got orders to the same base as me. A year into our relationship, I remember the way my heart sank when I found intimate messages between Miguel and his so-called high school friend while we were deployed. It won't happen again, he promised. I believed him. Months later, I would find that he simply moved the conversation to Snapchat instead. I was a frog already boiling in water that had been heated so slowly that I had not the strength to just jump out and leave him. With every uncomfortable action I adjusted myself to, I allowed the intensity of my environment to increase one degree more. He didn't allow makeup because, who are you trying to impress? I couldn't change my hair in a way that displeased him because braids and fake hair were ghetto. Coming from a black man, that won't hurt. I didn't dare gain a pound over 135 because he would find me unattractive. He stole money from me without asking. As he began to openly hit on my friends, I simply pretended it didn't happen. I was cooking because I ran out of energy and respect for myself long before. Though our split marked a monumental shift in the right direction, the environment I was subjected to did not change. As I exercised more autonomy and authority over my own life, Miguel seemed bothered. After the breakup, I attended a music festival and made a new friend named Mason. He was a handsome Chamorro gentleman with a wonderful jawline and kind eyes. He was very attractive, but I wasn't interested in dating anyone new yet. Mason and I attended an after party together. We kept up after the event through text, sending memes and music links back and forth. One day, he invited me to the movies. Let's meet at 10 p.m., he texted. I'm kind of strapped until my next paycheck. Maybe after that? I hesitated before pressing send. No worries, I got you. Pick you up half past nine? His text read. As I got ready to leave, Miguel demanded to know where I was going. The fault in my action was not creating boundaries after the breakup and allowing him to feel entitled to my business as a single woman. I was always honest with him before, but today my honesty was not welcome. Who is he? You're riding in the same car with him? Drive your own fucking vehicle. One of Miguel's rules while we dated was that I never was allowed to be in a vehicle with another man. I told Miguel I would have driven myself if he had not forcibly demanded the last $200 of my paycheck for his own needs, which left me without gas money. As I walked out, I remember some idle thread about it being the last time I I spent time with Mason. 
I didn't let it stop me from enjoying the evening. <laughs> and it wouldn't be my last time. <laughs> As Mason invited me over to his place again weeks later, during the evening, we watched Marvel movies and overstuffed ourselves with pizza. Miguel knew where I was and who I was with that night. He called my phone over and over, creating anxiety and misplaced guilt for my actions. I placed it on airplane mode and continued the night. Mason and I laughed until we grew tired and fell asleep. I woke up around 7 a.m. in his twin bed sharing a blanket. Our backs were pressed together as if we were featured as partners in crime and on a film poster. My spine rot rattled with vibrations from his heavy snoring. I quietly got up, used the restroom, and left for my car. The drive to my apartment was smooth. I never thought to take my phone off at airplane mode. Miguel was seated atop the stool. His breaths labored, his body his arms swayed in front of his body and his head dangled, restricted by the noose around his neck. The memory itself is silent. My heart began to pound as my body moved faster than my mind could think. Looking back, I know I owned furniture, but at that moment, nothing existed but that stool, the carpet, and pale walls. Where was my dog? The sound comes back to me as I press my fingers tightly into his neck and dig underneath the leash, eliciting a soft sob from his body and realizing his warmth never left him. The military has a good way of training you to do in high stress situations and process later. I have to help him, I thought. I had no sense of where the ground was. However, I, felt, I found myself carrying him from the stool to the bedroom. It was not an impossible feat as we were both of similar height and weight. The hallway to the bedroom was a short distance. He refused any more of my help as we came to the bedroom doorway. As he sunk beneath the covers, I offered words of comfort and a hot bath. His response to me crept from a place unrecognizable. You hurt me. His eyes were red and glossy. What could he mean by that? Surely he's not talking about Mason, I thought. I had no response. I was confused and I turned to leave the room. If I can't be with you, no one else can, he said. His warning jumped down my spine and punched me square in the gut. I remember hearing a voice that didn't feel like my own saying, this feels unsafe, I need to go. I'll run you a bath, I said. I turned on my heel feeling shaky. 15 minutes later, I watched him while he soaked. You can leave me, he groaned. I did not argue. I left him in the bath and pulled the door closed. The outdoor patio was private enough to drown my, drown my voice and provided enough visibility to keep watch for the bathroom door. I didn't want Miguel to know who I was calling. Hello, his father answered. His father was a father to me at certain points in my life and was the most wonderful gentleman I had ever met. He was a calm, unbiased man who always saw me as an individual. His love for his wife was exponential. I remember times that he would tell me that it was more important that I was protected as a young black woman and that he and his wife were invested in my well-being no matter what happened between Miguel and I. That hello unlocked doors, broke padlocks, and cracked safes I had never dared to open. Much of what I endured in our relationship, I kept to myself. I outpoured every concerning experience I had with his son, every suspicion I quelled, confirmation of every issue his observant father had once noticed. Rivers of relief and panic flowed as I let everything go. I was grateful to be heard and more importantly listened to. You're right, it's not good that you, got, you all are inhabiting the same space. Thank you for telling me. I will talk to him. His father's voice stood tall and certain. Thank you. I held on to his words, hoping it would hold me steady. I knew something was up for, with him for a while, but it wasn't my place to speak. I didn't know you all broke up. I'll take care of my boy. 
and in the most honest phone call I had ever had with anyone about my relationship, I felt lighter. Miguel's phone rang and the door opened to the bathroom. He hurried to grab it. Hello? Yes, I'm home. Why do I need to go outside? Hang on, give me a second. The front door closed and I was alone. I had 20 minutes to rummage through my belongings and gather enough for myself and my dog for a week. She sniffed at my ankles, unaware of how distraught I felt. I grabbed my bags to leave. I hadn't even heard the front door open announcing his return. I met his eyes awkwardly, not knowing what he would say or do. He sighed and moved out of my path defeatedly. Before I left, he spoke again. You didn't have to call my dad. I paused, briefly met his eyes, and moved past him. That night, my dog and I found solace on my friend's couch and would continue sleeping there for the next three months. It was personally difficult, leaving the apartment behind to choose an emotionally safer situation. I continued to pay our rent in full. In those three months, we kept minimal contact while I gave him time to move out. The week before, I had not heard back from him regarding when he would return my keys. The day before, I decided to visit to ensure everything was all right. What I saw was worse than when I had left it. Every belonging he had was strewn, strewn across the floor in no order. I could barely find the floor and stepped across and on top of clothing, books, papers, and shoes. He came out of the bedroom, disheveled and exhausted. I didn't know you were coming by, he uttered. I sighed, expecting him to ask for an extension. I turned around to take in the full view of a mess that looked like it would take days to organize. The next thing he said to me, I would have never expected in a million years. You know, I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't mean to scare you the day that you left. I just wanted to hurt you like you had hurt me. His words crept up my skin. I asked him if he implied that he faked his attempt. He sheepishly laughed. I mean, I never intended to kill myself. At that moment, I detached from reality. Surely there was a fourth wall somewhere and none of this was real, I thought. I fixated on a random stain on the wall past his head, waiting for the moment to be over. Then, as if he hadn't just admitted the most concerning thing I had ever heard, he mustered up the audacity to ask, will you help me pack everything up? My answer was no. 